Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here. Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So, let's take a look at something. This Bible study is going to be called who is my neighbor? Luke, book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 29. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Good question. Who's, who's your neighbor? Well, let's... That's the name of the Bible study, so let's take a look at the, the whole deal. Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer, now this is a, a doctor of the law, you know, somebody that knows the what the Hebrew roots people love to call Torah, you know, the books of Moses. Uh, for example, the book of Leviticus is the book for the Levites, the Levitical priesthood how they should do animal sacrifices and all the rituals. Now I've I have a basic knowledge of it. I mean those they were trained from their youth till they were like 25 years old. I mean they they knew they knew that information well. I just have a bare understanding of it myself, but uh but this guy's a, a lawyer. I mean, he's a doctor of the law. He, he knows this stuff. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. In other words, he's trying to trick Jesus. Not a good thing to do considering, you know, Jesus was the one that created the heaven and the earth. Saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He, Jesus, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Oh boy, when you ask Jesus a question, he's going to ask you a question back, especially in your field of expertise. Well, you're a lawyer. What's written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. See, that was in the Old Testament. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Good question. And Jesus answering him, um, and Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So, here it is. You had a priest, a Levite, saw this guy and said, Yeah, I don't want to get involved. So, he goes to the other side of the, the road, right? Verse 32. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Do you know that oil is indicative of the Holy Spirit. And what's the wine? Is not wine 
indicative of the blood of Christ? Hmm. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, an inn is just an old word for like a hotel, motel. There's 35. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence. Now, this was two days' pay for an unskilled laborer. And gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he, the lawyer, and he said, He that showeth mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Now, I don't want to make a big thing about it, but uh, oil. Exodus 27 and verse 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure olive, uh, pure oil olive, beaten for the for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Did you know that olive oil will burn, creating light? Isn't the Holy Spirit in our lives light? I would think so. Exodus 29, 7. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. That was like God pouring out his Holy Spirit upon whoever, the priest, the king, uh, for example. Oil. All right, the book of Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 10. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Oil, it was always indicative of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's take a look at Isaiah 61, and we'll close out this part about the oil. Uh, this is something that Christ read in the temple. Maybe I'll cover that, but I just want to prove that the oil is indicative of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not just pulling things out of the top of my head. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me. Now, isn't that what they did with the oil? They anointed people? Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Listen carefully. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. And we're not talking about... Uh, what, you know, comes after night. No. Mourning as in sadness for the passing of a loved one, perhaps. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Hmm. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings, tidings unto the meek. 
All right, the companion verse for this in the New Testament is Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, right? And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, remember in Luke 10, we read where um, verse 34, and the Samaritan uh, and went into him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Okay, now we took a look at oil. Now let's take a look at the wine. In Mark chapter 14, verse 22. And as they did eat, de uh, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, not all, many. Now people argue and say, oh, well, that doesn't prove it's wine. Verse 25, verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. Have you ever heard of grape vine? I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So it's interesting that the Samaritan poured in his wounds oil and wine. And of course, alcohol is a, not a bad antiseptic. All right, let's take a look at the book of John chapter 4. Verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Joseph, uh, Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Joseph was a son of Jacob, and Jacob had his name changed to Israel by God himself. Okay, so this was part of the, the land that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus Therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now, those of you that listen to me for a long time, you, you've heard this a number of times. Uh, one more thing. Um, Bright Eon won't let me... Um, uh, load any more videos. I guess I wore out my welcome with Bright Eon, but I'm still on BitChute. I don't know how long I'm going to be on YouTube, but I'm on BitChute. All right, so. 
There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Listen carefully. Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. She said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob? You see, she was also an Israelite. But she was of the northern kingdom of Israel as opposed to the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're going to go into that as soon as I'm finished with this. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus didn't tell, deny this. No. What did he say? Jesus answered and said unto her, said unto her Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, little background. After Solomon, okay, well, you had King David. Uh, first you had King Saul. Then you had King David. And then David's son, Solomon. And then Solomon had a son. I don't remember if it's Jeroboam or Rehoboam, I forget. But the names, do this doesn't really matter. What matters is, at least in this Bible study, is that he got greedy the taxes were really high because, you know, a large army and the uh, temple worship. So everybody asked Solomon's son to lower their taxes a little bit. Does that sound familiar? Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Well, the uh, son listened to his little friends that he grew up with. You know, the older folks said, you know what, lower their taxes and, and these people will be your servants forever. But the young people said, don't listen to these people. Raise their taxes. Show them who's boss. Show them who's king. So that's what he did. And the people said, you know what, what, what portion do we have in David, you know, of the tribe of Judah, right? So they... They split off, and they created their own kingdom, and their capital was Samaria, whereas the capital of Judah was Jerusalem. And you can read about this in the book of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. And then you had some bad kings in Israel. And I don't want to make this a several-hour study, which I could easily do, covering all this material, but, uh, you know, read it on your own. All right, let's take a look at, uh, let's go to Book of Jeremiah. Now, Israel, northern Israel, of the divided kingdom, and uh, boy, your demon nominational preachers will not touch this stuff. They absolutely hide this from their congregation because, well, there's two reasons. One, it would require a lot of study, and they don't really want people studying because, well, when you study 
and they're teaching lies and you start asking questions and it ex exposes their lies but uh, secondly they want you to think that the Antichrist over in the Middle East is all 12 tribes and it's absolutely not true I mean there was 12 tribes and even if the Antichrist in the Middle East were even one tribe where's the other 10 or 11 you know and they don't want you asking that kind of question no absolutely not so they want to convince you that um, you know and uh, oh by the way one of my listeners C. Michael posted a comment on the last video it showed up on my in my email as a comment but I went to the channel and it wasn't there and then I went to the spam um, section of the YouTube and it wasn't there either so I copied it off my email where I saw the comment and tried to post it on my own channel and it wouldn't take. I posted it several times and it won't take. As soon as I refresh the page, the comment's gone. Boy, there must be certain keywords that uh, are n YouTube will not allow comments to appear. Boy, I'll tell you what, it's YouTube's getting really bad. So it's pretty sad when you can't even post a comment on your own channel. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. That's why I tell you Brideon is no good. And uh, it won't even let me log in using my password. I can't even use, I can't even log in anymore on Brideon. And, uh, but I am still on BitChute for how long, I don't know. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Now, this is the law, okay? In Leviticus, I believe. Maybe Deuteronomy, I don't know. But this has a spiritual application here it's talking about Israel and the Lord you know the bride of Christ the church they say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's shall he return unto her again shall not that land be greatly polluted but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers yet return again to me saith the Lord Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not lion with. Now, the high places has to do with basically Satanism. Uh, I guess they were building a stairway to heaven, right? And uh, when it says that they lion, L-I-E-N, not, not a cat, but uh, spiritual adultery, In the ways hast thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers rain, therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. Now Josiah was a king of Judah. He was a good king. I, I hope to meet him one day. I mean... He was one of the last 
good kings before God sent uh, Judah into Babylonian captivity. Josiah was a good king. Wasn't perfect, but he was good. The Lord said unto me, In the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Oh, yeah. Now, here's the thing. Judah and Israel had different capitals, Samaria and Jerusalem. They had different kings, Josiah, King Ahab. And they had wars against each other. And your demon nominational preacher will tell you they're, they're the same. That's like calling somebody from the South a Yankee. Or calling somebody from New York City a hillbilly. And for those of you who think that I'm picking on Southerners, I'm, I was born in Kentucky, okay? Which was a Southern, considered a Southern state. Matter of fact, Maryland was considered a Southern state too. That's where the Mason-Dixon line was. You know, so I'm not picking on those of you from the South uh, you're called the Bible Belt for a reason. So, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. See, even after she had played the whore, God said, Turn thou unto me. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. See, Judah and Israel were sisters. Oh boy, your demonominational preacher will sure not read this stuff. That's why they always tell you, Oh, don't read the Old Testament. That's for the Jews. That doesn't apply to us. We're the church. We're a New Testament church. Because when you read this stuff, you're going to start asking questions that they don't want to answer. And I don't think they're, you know, how do you get a, a, a doctorate degree? How do you study the Bible for eight years? Or a, or a, a master's of divinity? Or a doctor of divinity? How do, you, how do you study the Bible for eight years in Bible college and you don't know this stuff? Okay, I mean, you know, really, they're deceivers. Really. I mean, you know, you're talking about a 501c3 state chartered corporation, IRS approved tax exempt business. And the bank, the Antichrist bank, holds the mortgage to the building, the church building. And the church is where two or three are gathered together in the name of Christ. It's, you don't go to church. You are the church. You can go to the car, but you are not the car. And you don't go to church. You are the church. Or you're not. Yeah, I'm not very nice to these people, am I? And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Verse 8, Jeremiah 3, 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced Israel. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now, Judah did the same things that Israel did. Why didn't God divorce Judah also? Because of the promise that he'd made to King David that there would always be a man to sit upon the throne of Judah. Well, and Israel. And of course, that's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Because Christ was of the seed of David. All right, verse 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, 
but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel, remember the Samaritan woman? The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Huh. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. See, Samaria and Israel were north. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. Praise the Lord for that and amen. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and yet have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Huh. Don't you know that's why the the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, God divorced Israel, but there's going to be a marriage of the Lamb because, you know, that's the only way, um, well, the husband died. Christ died on the cross, right? And he was resurrected, raised from the dead. So guess what? He could remarry his bride, Israel. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb's all about. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors, like ministers, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Hmm. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall they be done any more. At the time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered under it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the after the imagination of their evil heart. And in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Why do they mention house of Israel, house of Judah? Because they were two separate deals. And they shall come together out of the land of the north. What's north of Israel? Europe. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Maybe that's why the Lord says not to call any man your father on earth anyways. And of course, uh, the Lord said not to call any man rabbi because it meant master. But what do the all those messianic so-called call each other? Yeah. Rabbi. 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God, Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion, 
covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. That could be America or Europe today. Solomon said, nothing new under the sun. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow. And we're not talking about a needle and thread. We're talking about a farmer sowing seed in the field, right? Sort of. Behold, the days cometh the Lord that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. In those days they shall say no more, The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on age. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Listen carefully. Verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. And the Hebrew roots people will tell you, oh no, that's not what it meant. God's going to renew the covenant. In other words, he's going to take the old covenant and just, I don't know, stamp it, renewed. No, that's... They're liars. They're liars. New and renew is not the same thing. You could take an old car, strip down the paint, and repaint it. But guess what? It's still the old car. No. No. When somebody says, oh, I'm going to buy you a new car, they just don't repaint it. Okay? That's what the renewed covenant that the Hebrew roots people talk about. Sorry. No. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Isn't that what Jesus did at the Last Supper? Didn't we just read that? He said, took the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many. Yeah, that's not a renewed covenant. A renewed covenant means you've got to rebuild the temple and start doing animal blood sacrifices again. Oh, gee, wait, they're getting ready to do that if they're not doing it already. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. They break, not the Lord. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thank God for that. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So as long as you got day and night, Israel's going to be a people. 
All right, so who is my neighbor? In Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18, we read, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon them. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Against the children of thy people. Who is thy people? Israel. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You see, we were not supposed to live among the heathens. We were supposed to live among each other. That's how that was supposed to work. When you read Leviticus chapter 26, uh, one of the curses, well, verse 33 and verse 38, And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw, draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. That was 33, now 38. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. In First Chronicles 16.35 And say ye, Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen. Deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. Now, at the end of the 70 years Babylonian captivity, we read in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, specifically Ezra 6 and verse 19, And the children of the captivity, this is Judah, kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. And the children of Israel, which were come out, uh, come again out of the captivity, and all such as had separated themselves, separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land. Oh boy, not politically correct, huh? And all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful, and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Here's an interesting verse, Psalms 106, verse 41. You could think about America and Europe today. And he, the Lord, and he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Oh yeah. God gave us into the hand of the heathen. And those that hate us are ruling over us at this time anyways. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophecy, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. Now there's people that will tell you that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is two different things. I mean, isn't that basically denying that Christ is Lord? Really? For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Isn't that where we're at today? And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude and her fountains, I'm sorry, and her foundations shall be broken down. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people and all the mingled people and Chub and the men of the land that is in league 
shall fall with them by the sword. Huh. In Ezekiel 36, 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. God's going to bring Israel to the land, not the United Nations in 1948 to that little Antichrist state that's over there now. As a matter of fact, that is the fulfillment of the parable of the wheat and the tares. The tares are being gathered to be bundled and burned, which happens first. Oh, yeah. Here's an interesting verse, Joel chapter 2, 17 verse. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Therefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine. And what's corn? That's like bread, right? The body of Christ. And wine, his blood. And oil, the Holy Spirit. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. All right, let's take a look at Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. Now, Edom is Esau, and in Malachi 1, God said he hated Esau. And of course, your black Hebrews will tell, tell us that we're Esau. Whitey. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. What's a very small group of people that are heathens when it comes to being in Christ and that are very small in number and that are greatly despised? Is there a group of people, perhaps in the Middle East, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the cr ground? Let's skip down to verse 18. Obadiah 3 and verse 18. Well, 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any, there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. Good news, people. Uh, if you want, you can always go to the Jewish Encyclopedia and look up Esau and Edom and see what they have to say about it. Um, it's a very interesting article. I don't really want to get into it here, but... Uh, I'm just shocked that I'm still on YouTube for as long as I am. So, all right, well, so who is my neighbor? Well, Israel was supposed to dwell alone. 
in the land. The Bible taught separation and segregation and being scattered among the heathen was a curse for disobedience, which is where we're at now. Take a look at Europe. Take a look at the USSA. And just remember, people, Christ taught repentance, turning from our wicked ways and being obedient and honoring him. All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.